Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. For the managed futures business, if I were to speak to everybody in the industry, I'd say, look, let's stay true to what we do. Let's make sure that we provide non-correlation. People have stocks. Don't give them more stocks. But the, but the flip side of that is, yeah, but, you know, I've got to survive. Welcome to The Derivative, and thanks for tuning in with us. Today's special guest is someone who anyone familiar with the history of managed futures will know well. With many stories from being far removed from Wall Street and LaSalle Street, to extensive work with nonprofits, to creating his own fund, he's got a lot to share. And we're talking about Salem Abraham, of course, and his Abraham Trading Group, which has about as long a history in trend following and futures markets as you'll find. Uh, His newest venture finds him focusing a little more on the total portfolio, not just the alt spart, and weathering the storm for a total portfolio approach, which we'll get into. So it's just sure to be entertaining and educational. So welcome, Salem. We're so glad to have you with us. Bet, Jeff. It's great to be here here on the derivative. Thanks for having me. No worries. And so I've known you for a bit, haven't crossed paths at various conferences and whatnot, Uh, but let's give listeners a little more color on you outside of the trading world. You're down there in Canadian, Texas, right? Where in the world of Texas is that? So Canadian is a little town of 2,500 people, two stoplights. It's up in the Panhandle at Top Square in the northeast corner, um, about 100 miles northeast of Amarillo. It is a a town that's uh, ranching. The the main industries are ranching and then um, oil and gas. And so it's, um, I had two great grandfathers settle here with a Lebanese merchant and an Irish rancher, and um, the Lebanese boys kept marrying Irish girls for a couple of generations. So, yes. really, this seem like an odd mixing, right? Oh no! Well, the Lebanese are real mean and tough, and the Irish have a good time. So it's a nice mix. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're far north. You're like further north than Oklahoma City, and right? Yeah, right? no, you're we're actually as far north as you can get in Texas. Right? Yeah, no, you go uh, if you we go about fifty miles north. We're out of. Texas, and then about 30 miles east, we're over into Oklahoma there, too. So we're we're closer to five other state capitals than we are to Austin, including Lincoln, Nebraska, so way north. Really? And so, um, and so you spread out your roots there. You've got some farmland. You've got some ranch land. You've got some orchards. So tell us a little bit about all that. No, well, yeah, well, so... Um, yeah, you know, out here in the country, they it's everything's cheaper, so they just give this stuff away. So we're we're at ranch land, and then um, and then I've gotten over the last ten years or so into orchards more. So I've got a an apple orchard here in Canadian, then a peach orchard over in Oklahoma, and a pecan orchard down in Central Texas. And so just m- mainly as a source of fixed income for me, that is. Um, so, um, you know, and I have some other real estate investments that are just um, really fixed income type. Um, I don't like bonds as well, so but I like the fixed income component. And as a trader, you know, you kind of tend to you make money in lumpy ways and it's feast or famine. So to have that fixed income component is good, but I'd rather have it in the form of kind of real commodities, not fiat money. So Got it. And so I'm envisioning you like out there working the the ranch and the orchards is that the case or no no not so much i go out there when they let me i i usually break things or or maybe hurt myself if i go out there too much but um <laughs> no but i do have you know i um uh my kids they'll keep honeybees and i help them with honeybees so we've got honeybees out here that's kind of fun and then we um and then to go steal some apples or peaches when you're you know it's a, it's a minute 45 seconds if i go straight to work 
um, halfway across town. So I could swing out to the orchard and make it a five minute commute and still some peaches or apples on the way to work. So that's nice. Got it. And you've separated, you don't have the work compound as part of your house and everything. You've no. got a separate office. No, I'm in, I'm yeah, no, I'm in. Um, so my house is in the middle of town and then offices. Yes. Halfway across town, seven blocks away. So. Got it. And then it's so, been hard to separate Canadian from you for a while, right? Like you've helped do renovations and buildings and a bunch well, of well, no, we good and for the town. Sure. Well, I've been real blessed, um, you know, financially. And I think, you know, when you look at a town and you look around, it's especially a small town, you look around and there's really a group of, you know, a small group of people, maybe probably even 50 people that are going to, that really are able and willing to make a difference. And so you, you know, you end up, um, people step up and do different things, what they can. And, you know, that's true of even running, you know, the local government, things like that. And so, no, we try to help out where we can and do things, you know, invest in the community. And there's sometimes a return on investment that can't be measured in dollars. But, um, but yeah, the, the best job I don't get, Jeff, though, the best job in a small town, you know, isn't mayor or anything like that. It's you want to be fire chief. Fire chief, you get to, <laughs> you get to drive a truck and talk on the radio. And yeah, every, friend, little, every boy's dream, right? Yeah, no, and I, I'm not cool enough to be on the on the fire department. There's yeah, 32 <laughs> people, and you you got to be in the club and really cool. And so no, that, Scott Brewster, my friend Scott, gets to be fire chief, and so no, so and I can sure start, in a town that small, it's just all volunteer. I'm sure, right? They're oh yeah, no. Time. So the totally. bell rings they, and they leave what they're doing and go grab bet. the truck. You bet. No, that's right. No, and with eight kids, you know, so my wife and I, we dated in high school here. Then I went off to Notre Dame got a finance degree, came back and we, uh, we've been married now almost 32, let's see. Yeah. 32 years this year. And we have eight kids. So, um, you know, um, there's not as much to do in the country. So we had to make our own entertainment. And so we, so, but I was on school board. So school board is bad. I was on school board for 12 years. I make everybody, you know, after 12 years, everyone's mad twice. So <laughs> it's time to get off. <laughs> They're, they like you, they're mad at you, they like you, they're mad at you. Yeah, no, that's it. So, so but, eight kids, what's the spread there in the ages? So uh, today there's really, um, there's a, there's 10 years, 10 months, oldest to youngest. So uh, so there's seven, almost 17 on Saturday. It'll be 17 to almost 28. So this Did Saturday. You, so, so we're, I've got yeah. uh, four brothers and two sisters in my world, but they're from many different fathers and mothers and mixtures few yeah. divorces and stepmoms and stepdads and yeah no everybody wonders if there's a trick and you're like no no trick it was the yeah. two of us there was no surrogates no twins just no, no netflix right. no no nothing no no multiple wives multiple husbands no adoptions it's all yeah so what's just, the secret on 32 years of marriage how do you you got an algorithm for that or a yeah no you i have it's crazy coupons so everybody gets probably I think it depends me. I need a few more extra crazy coupons than my wife. She's less crazy than me. But if you can, if you can just say, look, you're allowed to have, say, you know, for me, four crazy coupons, you could be really crazy and make no sense on four things. And I'm going to love you anyway. And um, so I think you just got to give them a pass on some things. And then it gets, instead of trying to fix them, you just say, you know, you're, you're fine. Crazy and all. I like that. <laughs> and then do they give the coupon, then it gets ripped up or they can be crazy on the same thing for, for their whole oh, no, it's, it's pretty just one thing. You just say, no, this thing, but we're going to work on you elsewhere. There's some ways that, yeah, you'd like to try to fix them on some other spots. But, no, we, um, I think you just got to say, all right, we've all got our, our crazy, and um, we're going to – and that's okay. So <laughs> I love it. And then besides your work in the town, you're doing some – you've been heavily involved in a few different charities as well? Well, you know, I think being just um, – um, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And, um, and so if you, if you know something about investments and there's, you know, there's foundations and endowments out here that need, you know, that need investment advice. So I get on a lot of investment committees and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, so different foundations and endowments trying to help. And, and really and truly what you notice, you know, I know that, you know, there's this a red state, blue state and city and country and what, um, you know, I, I get to go to the city 
and I can put on my suit and I can take the subway in New York City and I know my way around the city well and I but I've I know seen you in a suit yeah you that's right nice yeah. yeah and so but you know I, I always think they talk about a frog in a well so a frog you know you 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 just know your own little world and I think that's true of in today's society with politics what they are where if you're in the country you know this country perspective and if you're in the city you know the city perspective i think you need to know the two and it and everything makes a lot more sense why people think what they do and, and out in the country really and truly i mean you look around and it's like if if you know if you and i lived across the street from each other and there's no one within miles of us you'd say if we've got a problem jeff you and i have to figure it out and out in the country that's what you've got to do people have to step up because if you're you know if if, if if not, you know, this group, this small group of people, then who? And it's nobody. And so you, you really, you, you step up and help. And so I've, I've done that. And then, um, and then that's led to some other things where, you know, now I'm on the investment committee at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital out of Memphis. And um, so I've been, you know, from that, which is about a $5 billion endowment down to, you know, a $500,000 endowment. And then, and then I've done things with um, Boone Pickens and I, he's a neighbor. He was a neighbor to us on a ranch and then he bought our ranch back in 08. And, um, but he and I have been friends for about 30 years. He was a friend of my grandfather's. And so, and he's, his, his big ranch is right here near town. And so he and I started a foundation together back in 08. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, best biography book name ever. The first billion's the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, and I'm in the book too. He says, Sorry, nice I just haven't read it. it. I, I know the title, but I, I was in uh, Colorado once at a bar or restaurant or something talking with a guy, and he's like, What are you doing in town? He's like, Oh, I'm writing this book on Boone Pickens. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and wait, he passed not so long ago, right? It was a year in ago? September. So? Yeah, in September. Yeah, September. He was, yeah. He, but he's, yeah, we had, I was real fortunate to get to spend time with him and he was a good mentor and we, a good friend. And yeah, no, I was a Paul Bear at his funeral, so we were, we were, uh, that was nice to get that honor and he you yeah, know he was a good guy and a lot of fun we had fun together yeah, so it was. oklahoma state cowboy that's it Throwing that's brick. it that's it oh uh, so how did how'd you go from canadian texas to becoming a hedge fund manager for lack of a better word i don't know if you like that moniker or not but yeah, well, no, it's it's fine. That's um, you know, I started um, I started trading futures in college, and so uh, I was lucky to uh, Jerry Parker. Um, I'd met him through a family connection, and he um, of Chesapeake fame. Chesapeake, yeah, right. And so um, I was. Kind of, I've always been. I, I'm, there's a lot of things I'm not good at. Jeff, but I am good at math and data and statistics. And so, so he had mentioned, and I you know was studying finance at Notre Dame and he had mentioned to me while I was about halfway through college, he had talked about what he does with basically technical analysis and basically using data to predict where markets he, may go. He was there at Notre Dame or he was, he was, there? so I saw him in, I met him in Canadian. So his, his first wife, she and I had mutual first cousins. So we were at, um, we were at those mutual first cousins houses here at the house here in Canadian. And so I met him, the new husband to a cousin of a cousin. And so he, um, wow. he told me, he told me about trading and what he did. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And so and he was an original turtle, right? And it was when he was a turtle, he was still working for Richard Dennis at the time. Oh, wow. So he said, Hey, well, you could come to Richmond and, and I could, you know, at least show you some of what I'm doing. He was just being nice to the new, you know, here he comes and meets, you know, 30 people, uh, his wife's family. And so I know he was just being nice looking back, but at the time I thought, oh, okay, great. Well, so then, then about three days later, I'm on the phone to him and said, Hey, when can I come to Richmond? And so, <laughs> well, so you then were he probably was nice. the only one of the, of the 30 that wanted to talk math instead of ranching. Or you know, I asked him, I said, well, had anyone ever taken you up on that offer? Cause he had made this offer and it was, I guess, just a, an offer that no one says yes on, but I was excited to go hear about it. So he was nice to kind of show me some things and point me in the right direction. And then, so then I started trading during my last semester at college and then uh, right out of college in, um, I got out a semester early um, with honors out of Notre Dame with a finance degree started in January of 88 um, managing money. But, you know, but uh, it was interesting. I started in August of 87 with a $50,000 account. I was taking 21 hours at Notre Dame 
a big load of classes. I was hurrying to try to get back to my now wife, my then girlfriend. My grandfather was back here with a job and he was a great guy to work with. And, um, but so the crash of 87 was two months in. And so that was an interesting oh, wow. time. Yeah. So, so you were trading 19th. from college during the crash of 87. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, like here we are now in the middle of the coronavirus um, crash and it's, um, and you know, we've had some crashes in between. So crashes tend to, they're, they're each one a little unique, but they all rhyme to some degree. So there's probably some kid at Notre Dame or elsewhere right now trading some account doing, yeah, no. uh, doing something we're not even thinking about. Yeah, no, that's right. We're yeah, getting an education. I know that first crash in 87 was an education for me. It was a, so the Euro dollar, the interest rate markets moved 37 standard deviation move. Wow. And, and, you know, I'd taken statistics about a year before and I thought, you know, they talk about one, two and three standard deviations and 99.7 is within three standard deviations. Well, it's that 0.3 that's outside of three standard deviations really is the most important part. And that's the part they never talk about because that's the part that breaks you or kills you is the, the you know, that, that 0.3% outside of three standard deviations. And you think you understood that from that early point that the markets aren't normally distributed and they have these outlier moves? No, I, no, but when they took half my account's value, I had a $50,000 yeah, account. <laughs> it sunk in a little bit. It went to 66000 in two months and then to 33000 on October 20th, 1987. That Tuesday was the day after the crash because the euro dollar futures, that's when they moved up um, that 37 standard deviation move. So no, but and it takes a while for some of that to sink in. So you don't realize it right away, but I did know it was a historic event. I was lucky to survive without, you know, without losing all my money. And, um, and, and I what, tried, you try to sort of model where you're doing is trend following. I was okay. trading 21 markets and trend follow a trend following model. So it was the turtle version version. Kind of a turtle, turtle version. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then said, hey, all right, I'm coming back to Canadian. I'm going to do this for a, a living. Right. Right. On you know, the my back of a 50% drawdown. Right. Yeah. My grandfather, he said, of all the ways to lose money, why in the heck do you have to pick the very fastest one? <laughs> so he was a businessman. He'd been, he had done deals all his life in oil and gas and he had seen, you know, he was a, he was an interesting deal maker guy that he was just great. So. The oil and gas to me always is a good corollary to trend following and to, right. Cause you're digging a lot of holes that don't pay off, yeah. but doesn't cost mm -hmm. a lot. And right. then boom, when one hits, you got this huge outlier. Outlier oh, yeah. gain. So it's lumpy like uh classic trend following would be. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a it's an interesting it, there's a lot of parallels. The risk management and diversification um apply to oil and gas very much. So how to side topic, how are all those people doing in the current I tell you, it's panicking you know, or they're it's up? really bad. I mean, right now it's worse than eighty six. So eighty six and fourteen um, are both kind of parallel to me, but right now we've gone from bad to incredibly bad. You know, there's literally, there's people with oil right now in the last 48 hours there have been, um, I've been hearing stories of just shutting in wells, just go turn off wells to say, look, we're, we're not even selling the oil and the gas. Usually that they at least produce what they've already drilled. They stop drilling new wells, but they at least produce what they're yeah. doing. But, I think I read today we're rallying today and because of that, because they're just shutting down production. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I mean, literally I know people who are out the, the guys that what they call pumpers and they go, they're turning off wells. Um, we've got a company on a, you know, and I invest some too in oil and gas as well. And um, we've got a company that is saying, we're not sure we were even going to buy any oil from you. They canceled our contract two days ago. And so they just say, you know, and, and, you know, you could, and then you see $20 oil on the futures, but it's out in the field. It's like $10 oil. Really? So it's not, yeah, you've got this big basis differential. And, and then jet fuel, I'm reading, they don't even have enough places to put all the unused right. jet fuel. Right. There's so not oil, enough physical storage out there in the world. Yeah. No, oil and gas is going to be really hurt. You know, there will be like, if you had a restaurant, you could see in six months, you go open the restaurant back up. Everybody's back to work. But oil and gas, you know, you're really, you know, you're, it's bad for six months, but it's going to be bad for another six to 12 months because of all this excess supply that's been stuck everywhere. Right. And you're not, no one's putting the investment in right now. Either. No, no. So the, uh, and that's on top of 
18 months of terrible MLP and right. the whole industry's had a tough go of it. Yeah, no, we've really gone from bad to not worse, bad to horrible. I mean, really, I've never seen it in my lifetime this bad. I saw 86 was bad, 14 was bad, 08 was bad and back. It was that V drop, but this is... I mean, this has gone to a, a, a point where it's just catastrophic for the oil and gas business, but, um, and a business really that's used to booms and busts. So. Yeah. Well, God speed to those guys. Oh yeah. So, so then you're there in, uh, what, so you started in your 87, eight, once you got back to Canadian and started managing money and that was just small friends and family and whatnot. Right. Right. My two brothers and my grandfather and, and me and yeah, my grandfather, he said, he, he, it was, so he had his, his provision was, so I put in 45,000 and then two brothers put in 10 and 15. And so I had 30,000, my grandfather put in to round out the hundred thousand. And, and I mean, he would, I mean, this is a guy who would go drill a half million dollar well and, and come up zero. So 30,000 is kind of in 88 and 88. So chump yeah, change, so chump change if, if to him. So he was a real wheeler dealer and did. And so he said to me, he said, he said, okay, I'll put the 30000 but if you get down to half, if we lose half our money, we stop this commodity trading nonsense, throw that quote machine out the window, and get back to real business. And so I said, okay, so that's January of 88. Well, it was funny then. So January, well, February, March, April, May, it's, it's going down. 81000 I start May. Well, May, the first 10 days of May were bad, and, and I'm down to just above 70000 Well, then um, – I remember about mid-May, because I was hoping we'd stay above 70,000. Well, it dropped below 70, and I'd get this fax in, you know, those curled-up fax machines from my yep. little thermal paper. Yeah, that, whatever that paper was. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so he comes in my office, sticks his head in that morning. He said, where are we today? And I said, $68,742. And he's just a matter of time. <laughs> <Rubbed his hands laughs> he together. wanted to get you into the oil business. Oh yeah. He was like, let's stop this junk. And this is a waste of time. And you're, you know, and um, I remember I showed him a big, uh, a big simulation. I said, look, granddad, if I had done this, look how much money I'd have made over this year. And, and he said to me, he said, Oh, Salem. He said, you know, you think that you and that Notre Dame degree, you think you're pretty smart, but those guys in Chicago, man, they're going to eat you for breakfast, spit you out for lunch. <laughs> He said, he said, uh, you know, he said, what do we do with all this paper? I said, well, look at the, look at all that. He said, what do we do this? We send it to Chicago. They cut us a big check. And I said, well, no, not really. But, and so, and yeah, so he was to say he was a non-believer is a, is a big understatement. But so the funny thing then is middle of May, 88, you know, then if you remember the drought of 88 kicked in. So I was 68,000 in the middle of May. By the end of May, I was back above 100. By the end of June, I was at like 170,000. Wow. And, and ended the year after I was had a fee of zero and 20, so a 20% incentive fee. After that, I, it was like at $240,000. So it made 140% year one. So that, that was a pretty good uh, cost of living increase in Canadian Texas. Oh, yeah. You bet. 88. Yeah. yeah. No. So that was the, so that. So then I, I traded till. January of last year, January, end of January, 2019, I stopped trading and, um, had a great time. And we, we had, um, you know, as much as 600, a little over 600 million at one point, when we shut down, we had a little over 200 million, but we, um, you know, the hedge fund space had gotten tougher fees had gotten lower. You know, I think we've, and expenses are higher. So what used to be a great business had gotten to be a good business. And, and um, it had nine years of, Oh yeah, of, tough, very uh, tough. Uh, the toughest on record trend following right. uh, environment. Uh, and and, and we had and then we had this new idea with the Fortress Fund, this new fund that we're doing. We had started it a year earlier, back in the middle of eight of 2018, and we were excited about what it could do. And really, it was an opportunity to kind of come from being it's like being a baseball player going to be a manager a bit. So the Fortress yeah. Fund is a little bit of a hybrid between we manage it. And we trade a little in it, but we also have a lot of outside traders, third-party traders, hedge funds in there. So it's an interesting opportunity for us to, and for me personally, to kind of slow down a bit, but really, too, to interface with. It's really well-suited for foundations and endowments, and it's kind of it's playing off of my role as, an, you know, being on investment committees um, and then – in the nonprofit world and you see a lot of small foundations and by small, I would say really anything under a hundred million, they just really tend to do a poor job of managing 
um, their money. Some, some do a really good job, but some, I'd say the majority have trouble either if they do a good job, then the fees are high or they, so, and they, and, and we yeah, just they say, they don't have a lot of scale. They don't have a lot of leverage. Right. They don't have a lot it's of all about resources. Scale. Yeah. Right. Right. And so that makes it harder. And then, and they can't attract good people on those investment committees. And so that's, um, yeah, that's well, me, it. We'll come back to Fortress in a little bit. I want to go back to 88 and your quote machine that your granddad wanted to throw out. What were you, what were you using? How were you generating your signals and all that way back then? So I had a Tandy 1000, a used Tandy 1000 computer um, that was, you know, that orange screen and yeah. big monitor. Was that like a Texas Instruments? Yeah, uh, well, was that its own yeah, brand, it's Tandy? Texas, I think it's t Tandy was its own brand, I think. Okay. Maybe it was a part of Radio Shack, I don't know, but I couldn't afford <laughs> a new one. So I bought a used one and um, and I had charts. I had, um, I'd, I'd get a, I'd send it every week and I'd mark the charts every day, you know, update them. And then I would just uh, generate signals from, um, you know, running the numbers and I'd have, I'd have my numbers every day. And so. Yeah. And you would actually run a, basically a back test manually. So I had, charts? yeah, no, I had, um, it was back then it was system writer. So oh, which yeah. now became Trade Station. Yep, I remember. And I, and I had a I had another programming. It was called KeyWorks. Was a you could it would memorize your keystrokes, so yep. you could essentially write a macro on top of System Writer, and it would um, it took about twenty four hours to do one simulation. Wow! And this is before you had a team or anything. So you're doing all this, yeah, yourself. Right. No. Your your story of bringing your granddad the. Uh, the results, the back results reminds me of I was starting a Tain Capital and I uh -huh. spent all this time on a business plan and all these projections and took it to my dad and be like, hey, we check this out. And I was so proud of it. And he just turned to me. He goes, nobody loses money on a spreadsheet, son. <laughs> well, like, and it's okay. good advice. You know, it's yeah, good yeah. advice. Like, but So do I do it? He's like, do whatever you want. But yeah, no, <laughs> it's not no. going to look like that. I'll guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think um, you know with it, it instructs me when I with eight kids when I want to kind of scoff at them and say you know kid it's not that easy and you know um, no one cares no one loves you your your mom and I sort of love you but that's it you know you want to <laughs> you want to give them that speech but I remember I got that speech but they were wrong because it did work right and so yeah. now about three out of four things he told me I was wrong on he was right. <laughs> but the one was a good that's right good one. so i wonder when with my own kids well maybe this is one of those one out of four i better give them the benefit of the doubt i don't want to throw water on cold water on everything so and then somewhere in there you told me the story once you were one of the largest electronic traders or you had a whole yeah. so you started to hire a team and have technology in the whole bit well so we had so in the late uh, late 90s so hedge funds you know the stocks if you look at 95 96 97 98 99 those five years I think the worst stock performance was like 22% to 38, and you know, it, was, it averaged about 25% stocks did for those five years. And I remember someone said to me, and I, at the time I was working for Commodities Corporation, which was a great group of people, and I was one of their traders, and they, um, well, someone said to me, why would I want the risk of futures if I can make 20% in stocks? And I, I heard said, that the last three years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I said, yeah, exactly. The same that we've heard lately. And I said, well, no, I get it, but I just don't think it'll keep that up. Well, so we had a lot of money leave. We were having five years of tough performance. Stocks were doing great. So when the money left, what we did in 98 is I became, I got a membership on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, got a quote machine, uh, their, what was then Globex, their Globex machine. And we started coding and we got permission. We were, we, we are the first people that had permission from the CME to automate order entries, to have a computer generated order. It took us, we had to get board approval. And um, so we started doing arbitrage electronically with my personal money because, um, so in like 95, I had 130 million under management. In 1999, I had 3.7 million of which it was 90% family and friends and my money. And so, so then I had, we, I opened a broker dealer with my own money and started doing this arbitrage and, um, you know, just stuff where we were trading like an ETF, like uh, the spiders SPY versus the S and P futures, futures yeah. or, you know, a lot of ETFs versus futures. And, and there then, were a lot of groups in Chicago doing that on the trading floor. 
Right. You, and so it's doing it from Canadian Texas, a little different setup. Well, and the thing that was interesting is kind of like, you know, the, the game slapjack, you know, except if you had, you, you're the 10 year old that shows up with a optical recognition uh, and an, on a computerized <laughs> arm hand slaps right. it and you start getting nine out of 10 jacks. So we were competing against people that were doing it on the phone and we, and we, um, we did real well for a while. And so we did that from 90, really 99 through, oh, let's see, oh, oh five, we stopped. We stopped in oh five. Yeah. So for about six years. And the competition and, started to get there. Yeah. Everybody was got faster. Oh five, kind of the high frequency training was being born. Yeah. The, like yeah true no, today, what we true. think of in nanoseconds. Right. And, right. So when we were, when we were, doing it early we would um and we had a lot of fun it was a great experience because you're programming you program all night and then during the day you're you know you can see how it goes but at night it was quiet so you could play around with their machine basically it was quiet so it was a it was a neat opportunity we have a lot of fun it was fun to program like that it was fun to see really the floor operation and um and i think to me i'll say to you know this high frequency trading it's so much better than the floor i mean i i get the floor was good but the I think just to be anonymous as an off as an off exchange trader, that anonymity is good to to be able to to feed orders in. To, it's cheaper. Everything about it. now. I what do you mean? The basically electronic trading, not right. necessarily high frequency, but yeah, high frequency, but electronic versus the floor. I like. I just people kind of bad mouth it, and I said, well, I get it. There's problems with everything, but it's it's better than the floor. Um, even though yeah. I, I have a lot of friends that were floor traders and did a well, great job. I tell people when I was a clerk and I'd go down there at six twenty in the morning in the bond futures, you know, as a 20 something year old hung over from the night before and I'd have to reconcile trades with other clerks right. at six in the morning. I'm like, this is insane. We're matching millions of dollars of trades and people are just like, it was kind of go fish. Do you have a four lot you're looking for in the bonds? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try this guy. I mean, so inefficient. Oh yeah, and we you know inside of all that inefficiency, people were like walking away from trades and hiding trades. Well, so those guys with the light blue coats—they were the, the yeah, isn't that the, the ones that the reporters? The, yeah, they would end up. Um, well, the out trades all the morning. Yeah. You were fixing. It was like four percent of all trades were out trades. It was yeah, it was, and it was insane. hugely inefficient. Yeah, no, and it's but um, but yeah, no. So we I've and so I've had a fun. I mean, I've really, I, as a math geek and a data geek, and to get to have a front row seat with the markets, it's, it's a lot of fun. Just to, And for you, especially not being a Wall Street guy or Ivy Leagues or right to even the playing field on electronic front is, is nice for you, I would assume. Yeah, no, we because we, there were days we were doing over 1% of the volume of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange from Canadian, from a two stoplight town in the middle of nowhere, 100 miles <laughs> from the nearest airport. So, I would have loved to seen that meeting when someone at CME figured that out. I'm like, wait, where's this volume coming from? What the yeah. heck's down there? Somebody we, get down there. I could tell you 10 funny stories about people just saying, what? Like, how did you cancel and replace an order 800 times? And you go, yeah, that's probably, it's like you did, you canceled and replace every two seconds. It's like, yeah, yeah that's probably right. <laughs> and now they have rules of like your messaging rates and all that. Oh, yeah. Stuff. No, we, we were, we were on the front end of a really interesting time and, you know, but to read like flash boys, the, the book, you know, you yeah. see Michael Lewis book. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause about half of that, I knew half of it, I didn't know. And, I, and there was probably a whole nother half that he didn't know that, you know, you, there were interesting things that, um, but, um, but you know, progress, things move and the world's changing all the time and we got to adapt. <laughs> As of the end of your trend following trading career in the beginning, like how much did the model change over those years? And, you know, we just kept, it was evolving always. We added more, you know, we added different time frames of trend following from shorter term to really long term. And then we even had some mean reversion things. And we had some things that were more pattern recognition. So we, anything that we could, our, our toolbox was find um, any kind of price pattern that has a predictive value. And so we were able to find things that we weren't constrained just to trend. So we were able to do other things too. So it was, um, so it, I think just the kind of the repertoire of models expanded. And that Did was you ever find yourself, I've been arguing for a while that the, a lot of the trend followers have had to kind of add long bias, 
at a longer time frame no. in order to survive yeah. and stay afloat like yeah fight that battle internally of like do I, I stay true to the the core philosophy of what am i trying to do or do i try and stay in business no absolutely no we had that we had exactly that for i would say 10 years because what you saw really was the the biases to add beta because you could basically go in and add you know you say well i'm a trend follower and gee whiz stocks are going up so i'm gonna get long and you're like look this is just an excuse for beta so you really you're you're adding beta to the market to 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 the model but the the research i had one research guy that was always like yeah but it's better and you go yes it's better but if we have a big market sell-off we don't want to be we've got to be that diversification we can't right. be correlated it's better if it's the only thing on the planet right if they're using you to be not that thing, then it's not better. Right. And that's where, see, in a way, the fortress is that, where it's like, no, we've got beta in the fortress. We've got stocks, bonds, and alternatives. We do all three. But they know there's beta, so they expect it. But with us as a trend follower, there's always this pitch in alternatives where we need to be, you know, we're going to be non-correlated. And the non-correlation pitch, which is true in most cases, but I think what's happened is different groups have let beta kind of sneak in and um, you've really got to be di diligent in analyzing their returns to see, I know what they're telling me, but are, is it true in that, yeah. is there beta in here? Well, it's hard to believe, right? We just posted our uh, asset class scoreboard yesterday for March. Mm -hmm. I think the Sock Gen CT index was up 17 basis points in March. Wow. Yeah. And see, right. that shows That's that they did their job. Unbelievably hard to believe. Yeah. No, yeah. It did their job, but you did, in the old days, you'd expect it to be up 10 well, right? yeah, with energy making that move, with bonds making those moves, you'd expect it to be a lot bigger upside than mm -hmm. it was. And for well, the, the years, it's flat to maybe down slightly. Well, you get some guys that um, that have openly added beta, but others that haven't. We but we didn't see as much beta in our group of traders in Fortress. We didn't see we we had one trader that really had some beta, but for the most part, we didn't see it. So it was. Um, I think if you pick the right traders, you just got to be careful now. And I think as the as the for the managed futures business, if I were to speak to everybody in the industry, I'd say, look, let's stay true to what we do. Let's make sure that we provide non-correlation. People have stocks. Don't give them more stocks. But the but yeah. the flip side of that is, yeah, but you know, I've got to survive. Right. And it's, it's insanely hard proposition of, right. Hey, you could manage $8 billion by putting stocks and futures together, right. or you could manage 200 million and be a small percent of someone's overall portfolio. You know, people got to feed their families and make a living. They're going to probably choose the former. You bet. No, that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs>Dig into the fortress fund. Been dancing around a little bit here. So, um, well, we yeah, ought to talk. The, you know, can we talk about just kind of lessons before we go to fortress? Can we yeah, talk about? Yeah, let's talk lessons. You know, over the last three plus decades, the lessons that I've learned, um, and I think there's things that your listeners and um, can can get some that you know I had to pay for some of these lessons. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to give for free. Anytime you get free lessons is better. So the one thing that I've thought of <clears throat> is I always, you got to be aware of where the crowd is in the market. If you think of the crowd as a hundred people, some people, you know, a hundred pounds, some, the big traders are 500 pounders and you've got to say, where are they? And, um, and if ever they're all leaning one way, then sometimes you get in a situation where the market can't get worse or can't get better and it can only go the other way. And those are times I think in the markets that, um, you need to watch for they don't come along as often as we would like but when they do you got to be paying attention so so like for instance i think cru the, the energy market which which we talked about are sort of that way now they are they're horrible they can't i think you wait another week or two and they can't do anything but get better maybe um and, you know doesn't once it, that gets priced into the market doesn't well, it seem so, like that's a little counter to trend following though it is like, oh yeah, no it okay. totally that's that one concept, of the lessons all right that's but but trend following works. Oh yeah, no, you're always with the trend. But and the and the thing about trend following that you've got to remember is it'll go further than you've ever imagined. Right. Like crude oil, you've got to imagine crude oil could go to two dollars a barrel. I think crude oil could go to two dollars. So so that's where um, 
be open to extreme possibilities. But once you get to extreme, then um, then you end up, you've got to understand, okay, it may not go any further than this. Well, so I always imagine it like a boat. And if you could sit at the back of the boat, watch 100 people in the boat, and you say, does everyone ever get on one side or the other, then you need to pay attention. Generally, they're somewhere in the middle, 90 probably 99% of the time. But every now and then you see them lean one way or the other. I was listening to the radio and they were talking, this has been 10 or 15 years ago, and they were talking about a tourist boat down at Austin, at Lake Austin. And there were these tourists and they were going around giving the tour of Lake Austin. Well, I guess part of the tour is they go by the nude beach at Lake Austin, which is a place um, called Hippie Hollow. Um, this, when I was telling the story, I think you'd heard it at a conference. Yeah, I, asked, yeah, I think I had to ask. he called out Sean Jordan Sean. in the middle of the conference and said, Sean, what's the name of that? Sean, what's the name? Beach? Yeah, I know. <laughs> he would know, and he did know. He actually did know. Hippie Hollow, he calls it. So, um, yeah, so so um, tourist boat goes by a nude beach. Nude beach is on the right. Lake is on the left. Which side are the tourists on? Well, they're, on the, they're all on the right. <laughs> they're looking at the nude beach. And um, now, unfortunately, nude beaches we would imagine they would be full of supermodels but generally they're not full of supermodels this is not usually, so much no not so much it's unattractive naked people that are fine being naked and um so you've got these tourists on the right side of the boat gawking at the unattractive naked people at the nude beach and then um so they get so far on the right side that instead of you know i would think well it can only come back well there's another option the boat capsizes so now you've got the boat capsizes now you've got the tourists in the water and who comes to their rescue to help them get ashore is the unattractive naked people <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that I've was all, the real life story of this isn't going any lower story. than 20 well the boat yeah, capsized it went to right. 10 that's right so so yeah, so the lesson is if you're with the crowd, you've got to be careful because at some point you may be, um, you know, you may find yourself being rescued by unattractive naked people. <laughs> and so that's a, that's a bad outcome. So, so beware when you're with the crowd, particularly if the crowd is going to an extreme. Uh, you might want to say, no, let's all go to the, let's go to the left side of the boat while everybody else goes to the right side. And you're, you're the one person not being rescued. I love it. I love that story. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's that. And then I think the other, you know, the one thing too is um, that idea where we talked about earlier, the things beyond the three standard deviations, I think to survive a financial storm, you need to study financial storms. You say what happens in a financial storm and how do I build a portfolio that can survive a financial storm? And so that's where, Really, you know, we know we hear about diversification, but um, but that's where that diversification and really smart and thoughtful diversification needs to come in, because um, right, we're, you know, we're you, talking just value stocks and growth stocks isn't diversification. No, no, and national stocks and U.S. stocks isn't diversification. Right. No, you get you know you you can you know what I liken it to is someone that does a fruit salad and they say, hey Jeff, try my fruit salad here. It's great. I've got red delicious apples. I've got Granny Smith apples. I've got Honeycrisp apples. I've got Fiji apples. Um, you know all these, and you know you know lady. your apples. Yeah, and you're just saying, yeah, no, I'm an apple orchard guy. <laughs> and so, so you say, look, hey, you, you would say to me, Salem, this is just an apple salad. You know, you, you yeah. might want to try a grape or a banana. <laughs> so <laughs> when we just do ver versions of equity, we've got an equity fruit you got an salad. Apple salad. Yeah, that's it. So it's not diversification and and study it in the RECs. Say what happens to this portfolio in the financial RECs. Challenge to, you know, when, you know, um, has been with fixed income in the last, really uh, since 08, with fixed income getting, the rates getting so low. And now we're, you know, last week they were, um, you know, they've actually even dipped a little bit in negative territory on the front end of the yield curve. Yep. Um, so. Um, you see that and you say, well, what used to be, say, 60-40 before 08, now is actually the benchmark is 70-30 because people keep creeping more and more toward equities. And, and you know, equities... Uh, to the lower, lower yield. Yeah, because bonds are worse and worse. And, you know, equities are kind of like a, you know, 
you know, say it's like a dog that is, is really nice 99% of the time, but, but every now and then it goes crazy and bites you and craps on your carpet. You say, you know, I think, I think you need to be an outside dog. Even bite you, but like (laughs) rip your face off. Right. 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 So that dog, you say, no, you need to sleep outside. I don't want you in the bed with me. (laughs) If you, if you, you know, if that 1% of the time happens. So stocks, you don't want to get too close to stocks because every, or, you know, in my career, about once every 10 years, it, it goes haywire and really hurts yeah, you. And, this and so you've got to think about that. 12-year one right. was a little bit of an anom- anomaly of taking a little while to go. The flip yeah. side of that is people would argue, right, of, well, hey, you told me this and I had, I was buying puts for 12 years and lost 40% or something, right? So it can't just be something that's no. negatively correlated and bleeds to death. You got to have something that, right. that survives. You're right. I think well, that's still the argument for bonds, but I would agree with you that bonds at five, six, seven percent. Yeah, no brainer. Have that in the portfolio. You're getting paid right. for protection. Right. Bonds at zero or negative. I don't know if I want to get nothing for protection. Yeah. I'd rather have some absolute return potential in there. Yeah, no, no. Bonds are the worst. You know, I'd rather own gold than bonds. If I'm going to have to be in something really like that, I'd say, well, at least I get inflation. But better than that is that's the alternative space. That's why you love alternatives. I do, it's because and again, as a math geek, I'm I'm saying, well, you know, alternatives are if they're non-correlated and they have real return, like I can make a decent rate of return with them, then they really bring something to the table that's nice. And so I think in the time of you know, when when bonds, like you say, were yielding five, six percent, a 60, 40 portfolio is a good portfolio. Um, you know, 70, 30. It's funny. No one's 30. No one has 30 percent bonds. You go looking at the yeah. largest college endowments, everybody they're 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 five to 10 percent bonds. And sometimes they're high yield bonds. So it's like, well, this isn't even this is zero bonds, which got. And, dumped on this in March. Right. Here. Yeah. Right. They're equity like when they're again. They, and then and then a lot of the hedge funds that they sometimes pick end up being, you know, equity like, um, you know, like you get long, short hedge funds. You're like, OK, let's think about long stocks. Yeah. Is is long equities, which is going to have a correlation, even though they say, well, the beta is point five and you go well, the beta is point five because it has half the vol. But it's if it's correlated at a one, it's not going to help you. So it's going to go down and it goes down less. It's just watered down stocks. Yeah, I agree. So you've you've had a nice story on your watered down whiskey before. Oh, yeah. No, well, that's it. Because you pay for you're like, well, if you're going to pay for whiskey, would you rather pay, you know, five dollars for whiskey or five dollars for watered down whiskey? And that's where. Yeah, right. Just, People have been like, great, I'm, I'm cutting my fees. I'm giving you this yeah. new low fee product. But yeah. yeah, all I did was water down the whiskey. Yeah, no. So, yeah. So you got to be you got to be worried about just, you know, in that case, you're paying hedge fund fees for watered down equities. And you're like, well, you, if you bought half equities and half treasuries, you've got half the ball and you got the correlation of one. You've duplicated that, you know, a lot of hedge funds that are long short. But, you know, you get some of the alternatives like global macro managed futures, some that are, uh, you know, stat arb that are equity neutral, um, not 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 a long bias. There are some things, hedge funds that really have no correlation. They have a decent rate of return. And even and better, I that. would argue, right, even better, they have negative correlation in a crash. Right. So they right. have on average non-correlation, but negative correlation in a crash versus some of the other products you're talking about have on average non-correlation, but positive correlation in a crash. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that deal of if you want to have, if you want to kind of hurricane proof your portfolio, study the, study the storms. And in the storms, you hear people say, well, yeah, well, when that happens, the correlations all go to one. We say, okay, you need to pay attention to that. That's important. Right. They, they do often throw that out. Oh, well, that you shouldn't look at that, that because everything went haywire. Yeah. yeah. Well, you say, well, look, I don't want like it's the like, compass had a magnet next to it. You can't pay right. attention to those readings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a guy that tells you, hey, Jeff, we, I got these seatbelts. They're really great. But, um, you know, on the average day, they're awesome. Now, in a wreck, they don't work. <laughs> but and you're like, well, what? that one no time I, I need a yeah. seatbelt to work is in a wreck. If the seatbelt does not work, if my diversification model does not work in the wrecks, I need a different diversification model. Agreed. Agreed. So that's so study the wrecks. If you've got something that correlation goes to one in the wrecks, that's not what you want. You want to create something that's that ha- you want to build your financial house with the storm in mind. 
and then it can survive the storm. And you've got to know, I can't put my, it's like back to the seatbelt analogy, I cannot do this in the split second while a crash is happening. If I'm in a car wreck, it's not in the middle of a car wreck I put my seatbelt on. You've done that when you left the driveway, when everything was calm in an environment where you could build your financial, um, uh, you know, your financial house that is, that is hurricane proof, you built it before the, long before the hurricane came. So it's this idea of thoughtfully building a portfolio before the storm and how do you, what things can you include that are helpful? And when you, when you do that research, you find that there's stocks and then bonds aren't, sadly, are not, a, not as good of, a, of an asset anymore. And then, but that's where alternatives can come in too. And alternatives, I think, are more important than ever now. And we so. Two comments on that. One, the storm, quote unquote storm you're talking about, I feel like people have a too narrow view of when and if that storm is coming. Like, yeah. do you think of that on decades long or a hundred years long? How do you view that of like what time frame you need to be protected for on this storm? Well, it's kind of like, um, I, you know, it's got to be, you figure your investment career, me as an investor, starting when I started trading when I was 20, um, I've got pretty good genes in my family if I take care of myself. And, you know, so let's say I, I trade till I'm 90. So I'd say over 70 years, you know, it's kind of like dying. It only has to happen once for the game yeah. to be over. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and that's where, you know, you say, okay, if I only have to go broke once to be broke forever, um, because you lose your stake. So you've got to, I think you've got to look at it. And then, then you, once you, if you look at it in a, you know, a 70 year time frame, you say, well, it's not if it's when there will be a storm. And, and in my experience, there's an extreme storm about every 10 years. And so you, you just, it's, it truly is like wearing your seatbelt. I mean, the odds of needing your seatbelt, you probably need it once or twice in your life. You're glad you wore your seatbelt and you want to make sure, you know, the same with building a portfolio, you say, I need to build it knowing that there will be a financial storm at some point. And I have to be always ready for it, just like I have my seatbelt on. And then my other comment on this whole concept would be, you know, the person who's like, I love everything you're saying. I get it. I didn't used to get it, but now I'm scared. Is it too late for me? Like, well, you know, yeah, that's, I, that's, I'm hearing a lot of that lately. I'm like, great. I get it. I should have had all this long volatility exposure, but I didn't. So what do I do now? Well, I, you know, it's kind of like when in October 20th, 1987, I lost half my accounts value. But what I did was I soaked up the lesson. And, you know, I think that first storm and even there was a storm came in um, January of 1991. I think it was the 17th. It was a Wednesday night, six o'clock. Um, the U.S. starts bombing Baghdad. Yep. And crude oil, um, the, I lost. That was the biggest percentage loss day of my trading career as a hedge fund manager. Again, it sinks in because it was a losing time. But yeah. you, but those times, so when something bad happens, you can either say, well, I'm going to learn from it or not. And to me, and what a crude rallied, you were short. No. So everybody thought crude was going to go up and it, tanked. Oh, it sold the news. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Buy the rumor, sell the fact. And, 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 and I sat there what I, and I wrote it down when I was done, I, the markets didn't behave like I thought they would. I thought gold would go up. I thought stocks would go down. I thought crude would go up. Everything went opposite of what. Yeah. I, I did. And then as a trend, as a systematic trader, what I did was I let my system run. And there's times that I would say this, the systematic model is always looking and, and assessing risk in the rearview mirror. Yeah. And sometimes as a human, you have to say, OK, it's it's not assessing risk properly because there's something getting ready to happen. Let's say there's an earnings report or something like that. Like if you had a Black Shoals option pricing model where you know implied volatility is different than not than the historic vol because you say well there's something getting ready to happen therefore the market's built in a higher vol well so as a systems trader i learned i needed to override the risk parameters and add more risk in the models so it would lower my position sizes yeah so my you, example yeah. to clients i was there is say there's some huge asteroid coming to hit the earth right. and they send a probe out to check out if it's on the exact trajectory Vol is, is what it is looking backwards until they say, hey, Wednesday at 4 p.m., we're going to 
the probe's going to tell us if the asteroid's going to hit the Earth or not. Like, right. there's just a total phase shift. Right. It's binary. If it comes back, right. yes, volatility goes 50x. If it's no, it's so, yeah, right. I agree with you on there that you yeah. can't always be looking in the rearview mirror. No, and you need to adjust your positions knowing that, hey, there's going to be a big event because, like you say, it's either all good news, all bad news, binary, and the market's going to react. So, But in the meantime, there's no vol. Everyone's on the edge of their seat ready to move one way or the other. So, so my back to your point is it's never too late because there's another train wreck. There's another storm coming. It may be another 10 years from now, but it's never too late to, to do it. And sometimes they're not evenly spaced, you know. <clears throat> You know, when the when the crap hits the fan, it's not evenly distributed and it doesn't come <laughs> it doesn't come in nicely spaced intervals. And so we don't know when the next storm's coming. It could be in six months or it could be in, you know, in, right. and, and who knows if we're even out of it yet. Right. Like, oh, yeah. No, I, there's plenty of storm left. This, this, you know, the interesting thing as a data person, you know, I panicked on panicked. I, I, I kind of rang alarm bells at Abraham Trading on January 26th. I said, look, this is a big deal. We need to watch it. And then over the next, because um, there was about, I think, 500, less than 500 deaths in China and about 20, uh, 2,000 cases. And I said, um, I wanted to see if, if, uh, if uh, what I would consider a top medical country had people die. So, so it was about a week or two later, someone died in Japan. And I said, no, this is serious. Yeah, that's because, a real deal. Yeah, because, they, you know, they can't blame it on, well, poor, the medical care in China Oh, um, well, the, well and but, now we're hearing that they're really like 40,000 deaths in Wuhan and they were under reporting. Yeah. But no, uh, well, to me, so this whole thing's been interesting. You can quickly see the type of people that uh, understand exponential yes. movement and outlier events and all that. They were worried and they were preparing. Right. And other people are like, what are you talking about? There's only 20 deaths. Right. And I was like, yeah, if you double that every two days right. it's a big well, you number know, in there. you know it's that joke uh would you work for me for 30 days i'll pay you a penny the first day but i'll double it every day and yeah, by the end you want a million dollars now or a penny doubled yeah, every day for 30 days yeah, yeah. The, and the by the end is pennies more yeah it's like 450 million or something at the end yeah yeah the last day it. so it's crazy but you know because it's a penny two pennies four pennies eight pennies 16 pennies 32 and you're like this is this stinks you're like My give it time Right. My kids have that of how many times do you have to fold a piece of paper to reach the moon? Ah. And it's, I think it's 46 times. Wow. But that's the, right. The 45th yeah. time you're halfway there. You're halfway there. This is the big, that right. 46 no. fold is a big one. We've yeah, tried it. We can only actually physically fold it. I think six times yeah. before it's too unwieldy. Yeah. Well, that's we, fascinating. No, well, that's good. Well, the, the, the exponential piece is the part that, you, it's kind of like compound interest. People underestimate it. So those lessons, that's what led to the Fortress. The Fortress Fund was an idea that, you know, we were, where we were in the alternative space with a hedge fund, and we would say, um, you know, Jeff, we, um, we do this one thing in the hedge fund space. We could be one piece of your 20-piece puzzle. And... Um, and then we would see them really mess up the other 19 pieces. They wouldn't do a good job. And so, so that might even fire you because they screwed up the other 19. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And so yeah. what we that did, before. that's it. And so we, so with the Fortress Fund, it, and it's an outgrowth too of a, a, a Boone Pickens and I did a foundation together um, called the Pickens Abraham Foundation. We both had put in 2 million bucks to help kids in this, um, these two counties, um, of Hemphill and Roberts County, Texas, where Canadian is and where his ranch was. And, you know, total population in the two counties is about 4,500 people total. And you've got two school systems. And um, we wanted to help really kids and do college um, uh, college scholarships, things like that. And so so we did See, that. I, with, I knew you were downplaying your charitable efforts earlier. So. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> so. Congrats on that. Yeah, no, well, it was fun. It was fun working with Boone. And we he cares, you know, about um, obviously OSU. And, and there's a lot of kids in our area go over to Oklahoma um, to go to go to school, too. And so we, so we, um, it was fun for me because I got to be, king of my own investment committee. So I had my 2 million, I got to invest and Boone invested his 2 million. And so we ended up then, um, so I got to try out what I wanted to do if, um, you know, if I could be king of my investment committee, because, you know, they say what a, a committee 
formed to build a horse, you get a camel. And right. you, and anytime you're on a committee, I always remind myself when they're doing something that I think is stupid, I'm like, okay, I guess here's one of these stupid humps. I, and then I just kind of keep my mouth shut and know that this is, this is the inevitable and outcome. Steve, Steve Jobs famously said, we have no committees at Apple. Yeah. <laughs> we run it like a startup. And he would say like, no, that button's stupid. Well, sir, everyone yeah. thinks like, no. Yeah. Change yeah. It. yeah. No, no. Well, there's, there's some, yeah, there's good and bad with it. I'll say I've seen the wisdom of a committee, but I've seen the bad of a committee. And the part that's bad is a committee. They, they don't believe the math. They really want, they, they're, we've all been taught like 60, 40. Who came up with that? I mean, it, yeah, it, it just became a thing. Out of yeah. Nowhere. Yeah. 70, 30 people pull these numbers out of their ear and everybody says, well, you know, we've been all been taught. I'm like, well, have you ever done the math? Because the math will tell you a different outcome. And to me, what I always saw when I looked at the math is I'm like, look, your stock portfolio, your stock piece is way too big. You've got way too much risk to stocks. You need to reduce that. You, you're, and you need to bring in alternatives, but the right alternatives. So there was this real clear way I had in mind. And, um, and so I did that for 10 years with, in the Pickens Abraham, and it did really well and had this proof of concept. And so then, and at a much lower risk. And so then that's where um, the team said, we ought to have this as a product because there's a lot of foundations and endowments that could do this. And so that's where the Fortress Fund came. And we, you know, and then our fee was just 0.65%. So we have this low fee and we say, look, and I've got, you know, I've got over 10 million of my money in it, either personally or my kids, or then now my foundation. And so I'm like, look, you basically, you coattail me, I'm going to invest in stocks, bonds, alternatives. It's the whole package. And if, and really, you know what, it's, it's like Ray Dalio's all weather fund. Um, I thought that was a neat idea where, um, what he did. And, um, and so it's, and it's, it's probably half the work for me. It's a smaller team on my side. You know, it's again, on back to the baseball analogy, I don't have to get up for 6am workouts and, um, but I've got a great, you know, so, but we have between six and 12 hedge funds that we invest in third party hedge funds. And so and it's so, a neat product. And so the Abraham classic model is not one of those funds. No. It was for the first year yeah. of it from eight from 2018 to 2019. No, we don't. We we just say no. We're going to let third party people do it, and then um, and so it. I just think it's a cleaner model, and I think too it it becomes a model that you know someone says, you know Salem, you just handle it. And, you know, I was talking to a lady this morning who does a foundation in Lubbock, Texas, and you know, they're, they're worried about people in Lubbock now with the coronavirus and how do they, you know, they've got, they, they're worried about the mission they have. And what it allows us to do is we can come in and say, look, let us be your investment committee all in one. Your foundation's invested along our, my own foundation and my own retirement money and some of my kids' money. And so you, you say, the game. yeah. And then, and then just coattail me and, and, and so it's a fun product, but it, you know, it's like what you all do at RCM, where if someone comes to you and you say, look, we would like to understand alternatives. Can you help us? And, you know, and y'all can look at their portfolio and you can give them a, a piece of that portfolio because the hard part is, and I see this on investment committees, people don't understand alternatives. Um, they, they don't do the math. They don't have the depth of knowledge that um, like, um, you know, like someone like y'all would have or others. There's, you know, there's, I think there's yeah. probably a, a dozen really good alternative shops in the country that understand it well and uh, friends of ours and people like RCM. And so, and, and it depends like on, they usually end up with a big name because of that lack of understanding of like, all right, if yeah. I don't know the right one to pick, I might as well pick the one everyone else picks. Yeah. Kind and of no one got fired by an IBM approach. Right. No, yeah, no, absolutely. You see the big, yeah, the big, the big marquee names, but the reality is, you know, and I, I had this discussion um, with um, with a consultant not long ago. I said, look, they're a big name, but I think the smartest people don't work for the big names. Really, they go out on their own and do their own deal. So, and me in the business, I've just seen the smartest people go do their own deal because, the, you know, the big the big name, you pay to be at the big name shop. So they can't, the best talent in the business goes and does their own thing. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, you, and, yeah. And so then on Fortress, are you guys also running the beta piece? We, yeah, no, we do the stock. So we do beta and we'll do stocks and bonds 
and there's no, so we don't do, there's no mutual funds, no underlying. We just pretty much index those. So we say, okay. look, we're going to give you. So you're not trying to add alpha no. there. You're just, let's no. get a pure beta. Right. So we do SPY beta. SPY ETF or whatever. Right. But no, but no, not even, but we don't have ETFs. We build, like, you know, when we did the, so going back to say the, the equity arbitrage stuff that we did. So we yeah. would build baskets. And so we were like, well, we know how to build that. So there's no cost. So we don't want the nine basis points of SPY even. We just say, I love it. There's not yeah. too many people are worried about nine basis points. Yeah, no, we, saying, hey, yeah, we know well, how to get around that. Yeah. And the piece of just the third party, I don't, I don't want to have my money in an ETF. I'd rather have the exposure directly that then, you know, my grandfather taught me about CIF and CIF is cash and fist. It's like, <laughs> look, you better be in your fist if it's your cash. So I want to make sure I haven't given my money. I want to have it close to my hand. So. Yeah, and we've seen in this crash some of the bond ETFs and getting dislocated from their nets right. and whatnot. Right, right, I right. And it's in the storm that you have trouble, and that's when you don't have trouble. And so this started just for your Pickens Abraham Foundation. Right, right. We should have come up with something uh, more clever for that, the Abraham or the <laughs> Abra, well, well, Abraham Pickens. I yeah. have I have a lot of respect for, for Boone, so he gets to go first, Pickens Abraham. <laughs> so the uh and but then you said, Hey, where other people are approaching you and you said, Well, we've got this program we're running for this foundation, we can run the same thing for you. Right, right. So and yeah. then it's since so the the way the foundation was set up is if either one of us uh if if Boone or I the the first to pass away, then it gets split. So his part went to the T Boone Pickens. My part is in the Salem and Ruth Ann Abraham Foundation. So for my wife and I, and so we, um, so then, um, and really that's then where, um, and the Salem and Ruth Ann Abraham Foundation is invested in the Fortress Fund. And so it's, you know, we don't pay fees. The, the, the foundation does not pay Abraham training fees because of conflicts of interest, but it, um, so that's where hundred percent of my foundation is, is where uh, about 90% of my kids' money is. And then I've got a big chunk of my, um, retirement in there as well. So it's, it's a safe place to put and money. You, your wonderful yeah. daughter, Kate works for the fortress fund. Or she yeah, works for no, hand trading and yeah, no. So she's the oldest of the eight. Kate is, and she is director of marketing and a smart girl. Yeah. And you know, the, the good thing, Jeff, about eight kids is I tell people said, you know, the diversification works in all ways. And with eight <laughs> kids, you know, you're bound to have a few winners out of eight yeah. and there's not as much pressure, you know, and then, and, and, you know, like in your family, you're one of the winners, see, but you go, but you yeah. know, there's bound to be a few losers too. Oh, we, we got some. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you he, go, okay, we love them, but you know, but uh, you say, but, but again, there's no pressure. You say, you know, if you have one kid or two kids, you're like, oh, they got to be winners. And you're like, with eight, you're like, no, I'll just yeah. accept the average. Let, let the chips see where they, where they land. <laughs> I love all uh, my kids, but yeah, no, Kate's, Kate's one of the winners for sure. I'm not sure about some of the others. They're all... <laughs> I get it. I'm in the same boat there. Yeah. Um, no, in a quarantine too. Now with the quarantine going on, we we're not sure if we like him as well. <laughs> and I so love my wife. Ten, important. So what's yeah. how old's the youngest? Are there any still he's, in high school? Or they're yeah, all he's, yeah, two of two in high school. It's a junior and a senior. The youngest turns seventeen Saturday. So we're yeah about seventeen to we're we're in that ten year ten month that two month window where there's from going to be twenty seven to to 17 so See, my kids are young eight and 11 so i've been saying like i feel bad if you were in high school right now during this oh, lockdown yeah. and all this stuff or even in college like oh, taking yeah. away some of your best years yeah so three of our kids are in college they had to, they got sent home from college we have a senior who she's you know no junior senior prom no grad probably no graduation no oh. all the end of school stuff so no it's kind of a bummer for them for sure so that, yeah, this is going to shape that generation in ways we probably don't even realize yet. But we'll yeah, see they'll they'll happens. they'll all be toilet paper hoarders. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that, but we you do know. have a, a lot ourselves. Yeah. All right, we're going to uh, wrap things up here. Anything else you want to add on the Fortress Fund? No, no. I just it think it's in the portfolio approach. No, I think it's good. I just think, um, yeah, no, I think we covered I mean, it well. I'll, I actually had a question I just remembered. So is part of the whole idea there's the rebalancing as well? So right. Well, so 
if yeah, stocks no. are doing really well, I'm going to take chips off table, put it into the alts. Like right. in a period right now, the alts just paid out. I'm going to take that off. It's going to allow me to buy into stocks at these lower levels. Right. No. Yeah. No. We there's um, there's some rebalancing. There's some risk management too. You know. Uh, you know. In uh, January and February, we were actually you know stock volatility went up. We there's some rebalancing there. That doesn't happen very often. That would be something rare. But typically, we're about 45% allocated to stocks, 20% bonds, and 35% alternatives. And so, and, will you amend that per our bond discussion, or that'll stay? No, we always have some exposure to bonds. I don't like it, but we're going to have exposure to <laughs> yeah, it. It's, it's how the math of, works. Yeah, no. You, well, you know, and if you're competing, our competition is really we're trying to beat the top 10 college endowments. And, you know, if you're in a if you're in a you know a contest who can make the best spaghetti, you gotta have noodles and red sauce. So we gotta yeah. have stocks and bonds. <laughs> it's the, the spices, Harvard, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, Harvard's been coming under a lot of fire because they're like laying off their cafeteria workers and stuff. It's like, why do you have this fifty yeah. billion dollar endowment if you're not gonna use it in a scenario like this? No, like, exactly. What, what is it for? Right. Well, it's just to keep building bigger and bigger. No, no, I think that's right. Great. Well, I'm going to switch over my background here for our favorite section. Yeah. Give me a second. There we go. Inside the Millennium Falcon. Hey, look at there. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so this has been a great episode. Thanks for joining us and sharing all your wisdom. Uh, we wrap up all our pods with a little bit rapid fire favorite section. So I'm going to ask you some of your favorite things. Okay. Uh, favorite animal on the ranch out there? Oh, you know, so honeybees wouldn't count. That's an insect because we like our honeybees. I think an um, insect's an animal. We could give you Yeah, a I'd say chickens. So the chickens, chickens we just got so we can get our eggs. Yeah. Yeah, my <laughs> wife's cousin, they're in Seattle, and they have yeah. three chickens actually in their little backyard. So they say they get an egg a day. Yeah, no, that's it. You bet. That's crazy. You bet. Yeah. Uh, do you listen to podcasts at all? Sure. Some. Yeah. yeah. What are you, what are your favorite podcasts? Oh man. The derivative, you know, love the one you're with, right? <laughs> yeah. Besides <laughs> well, this one, besides, besides this, one. this one, you know, I liked I, the one that, um, the systematic investor, the, with, uh, Jerry Parker and, um, yeah. Moritz and Niels, those yep, guys, yep, yep. That, that was, was fun. Very good. Yeah. This... Uh, favorite orchard crop. They oh, call peaches. it a crop or a... Uh... A crop, yeah. Peaches. I like peaches. Now, apples, I make more money from pecans, though. Yeah, um, there's a, uh, a old fund of fun guy here in Chicago. He quit, retired, moved out to California, and started an almond yeah. operation. And say so he makes mm -hmm. 10 times more money than he ever did in the hedge yeah. fund business. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good um, fixed income substitute, I would say, because you, you make... Now, it's a little lumpy. But it, um, but it provides regular income, and, and it isn't, you know, negative rates. It's a, you know, I think you can make on an orchard, if you're willing to kind of put up with the extra work with it, you know, you can make 8 to 10% on your money and really not work that hard, so. Really? And then, so does that, are there management companies or people run all that, and you're just the investment, or you got to figure all that out? How to, no, I've got, how to I've got a guy, it. I've got. I have managers that run it. And then there's a one main orchard manager that he runs the orchard here. And then he manages the other two helps, helps manage them kind of oversees and it. I have, I could do a whole podcast on orchards. I'm so curious, but I'll just, the last bit on orchards is have you seen a downturn at all with, with what's going on or no, you know, less likely to get there or an upturn. They want more, or is it it's such a long lead time? It doesn't matter. No, it's kind of a little of both. Um, you know, I think ultimately there's going to be, it'll help, but we've got to pivot where we've got to do more kind of deliver to your door. You know, if I could say, Jeff, hey, in these trying times, I, we're going to deliver a box of fresh peaches to your door. Yeah, then straight you say, from hey, the orchard. Yeah. Right from the orchard. And so I think that's what that kind of thing with peaches and apples. Now, pecans, um, pecans will be interesting, but I think people right now, you know, a pecan is a, is a food that you can, it stores well. So you don't have to refrigerate it and it can sit there, you know, in the shell. And um, so I think that the things I have are going to work well. I think others, it's a little harder. It depends on how well it stores. And so it's, it'll, it'll be interesting. We don't know yet. Yeah. So, it's odd to me. You've chosen crops without futures markets to hedge. 
Yeah, no, no, it's more <laughs> fun. To, yeah. It's in a way, you know, the volatility you get, you, you, you get, uh, I think rewarded for that being willing to take a, a lumpy set of returns. And if you diversify, it's kind of like alternatives. If you diversify on their non-correlated stocks or non-correlated crops, you know, in this case, you say it'll work out. Yeah. The pecans lumps. and apples are pretty, I mean, I guess you could have both those could be a nice pie, but yeah, I, I need, I need thing. a pineapple orchard and then I can get in the fruitcake business. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's as uh, lucrative. Favorite investing book. Uh, you know, I, I really like Jack Swagger's, uh, market wizard and new market wizards. I like those. I like, um, were you, were you in I either no, of those? No, it would have been better if I was in there, but yeah. <laughs> if I was featured. No, but you were you know, in Covell's book, right? Yeah, no, I was. And you know, I think with, um, to read an interview, just, you know, I think to really hear the words of a trader is important. Sometimes you see there's something lost in translation. So I liked it where it's that interview style. I think that was helpful to me. Um, you know, I like the two other books I like, which are just good financial advice. There's one called The Richest Man in Babylon. And then there's a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And they both are really talking about the importance of saving yeah. and, you know, to save 10% of your, you know, and that discipline to save. You know, I think one of the, you know, the one of the biggest things about building wealth is saving. And, and saving early, especially early. Right. And it talks about those in those two books. So I think for someone that says, hey, I want to have some money and have a good retirement, read yeah, Richest Man in Babylon or Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Both of those are really good books, too. Got it. Uh, favorite. What do you have down there in Canadian Tex-Mex or or barbecue or Mexican food? Oh, all of it. Yeah. No, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> yeah. You, you just it depends on the day of the week. Right. So how many gotta... restaurants are there there? In Canadian, so we have um, the Dairy Queen and Pizza Hut are the only two chains. Okay. Um, the, the nearest Starbucks was 101 miles away. Then they put one in a grocery store 45 miles away. So we don't have, but there is a good coffee shop. But then there's um, the best restaurant in town is, so we're on the second and third floor of our building. And the first floor is the Cattle Exchange Steakhouse and Barbecue Place. And they have, they were listed as one of the top barbecue places in Texas. And, um, and you know, it's... Um, a barbecue that's just one floor below you and steaks one floor below you is better than barbecue and steaks 500 miles away. So, so yeah. that's got to be at the cattle exchange steakhouse for both barbecue and steaks. I love it. I can't wait to go back out to a restaurant. It's gonna be yeah. Yeah, ben absolutely. Uh, and then we ask everyone, lastly, your favorite star Wars character as I'm sitting here in the millennium Falcon. Yeah. On Zoom. No, you bet. And it looks very cool too. That, yeah. You know, you know, I, I would have to say Luke Skywalker, because just because, you know, Yoda, it would be great to be, you know, I, I would, I guess I'm trying to identify who Yoda is way, he's, he's like there, he's arrived. Luke is he's still too meta. Yeah. Yeah. Luke right. is Luke's on the still journey. seeking knowledge and yeah. Yoda's and, given knowledge. I don't know. You're probably pivoting more to Yoda these days. No, well, I, I, you're I don't giving think out knowledge. Any trader, yeah, you never get to Yoda. The Yoda is the ideal, and Luke Skywalker is all of us on that journey to our best version of ourselves. So I think whatever you're doing, you hope you're, you know, you always hope for that force to be with you and the, the and good and all that. So I like that. I so, love it. That's our best answer yet out of anybody. Oh, man. Thoughtful. Well, all right. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Salem. Uh, this has been fun. And good yeah. luck with the Fortress Fund and all you're doing to help everyone down there in Texas and St. Jude and everything. Yeah, well, Jeff, uh, thanks for safe. having me. Thanks for we'll having do. me, man. It's great to be with you. Stay safe, too, and we'll all – I look forward to sitting down maybe to some barbecue or steak sometime soon in person instead of just – We'll do. I got to make it down that way. My brother's yeah. in Dallas. Maybe I'll drive and stop. Yeah, stop yeah, in stop in. Stop in. We'll take good care of you. We'll make sure you show up in Dallas heavier than you left Chicago. <laughs> we'll do. All right. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.